Okay, awesome. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, I think uh, copyright is an exciting topic, but I know uh, not everyone hears the word copyright and thinks, oh, that sounds exciting. So <laughs> I really appreciate you uh, attending or watching this recording. Um, why is it important to know about copyright? Um, it's all of our responsibility as people who work with material that does have copyright attached to it um, when we're working at a university. It's our responsibility to all know the basics of copyright um, and make sure we're following university policy. Um, and so I really appreciate you taking the time to learn a little bit more about copyright. Uh, and at Memorial University, um, the libraries assumed responsibility for copyright management in January of 2020. Um, so prior to that, it was uh, CITL who was um, managing copyright um, on a university level. Now we've been working in copyright and doing a lot of work on copyright clearance at the libraries for a long time, um, but we officially kind of um, assumed, assumed responsibility for it in 2020. It was a very fun time to transition to that, by the way, <laughs> during COVID. Um, so each branch uh, of the library does have its own copyright liaison librarian. Um, so, for example, I'm at the Grenville campus and I've been the copyright liaison librarian since 2011. Um, as I mentioned, we've been doing copyright at the library for a long time, way, way before 2020. Um, so here's some contact information. This is also available on our website. Um, but just to highlight that um, at each branch, there is a dedicated librarian um, who is responsible for answering questions about copyright. Um, and then we have our e-reserve service, which you're going to learn a little bit about, which is the main way that we're doing clearance for course materials. Um, and each uh, uh, branch has its own e-reserves department and e-reserve staff. All of our librarians and staff who work uh, in these areas have completed a certificate in Canadian copyright law, uh, which is a 12 week online course. I've done it as well. Um, and it's uh, from copyright lawyer and author um, Leslie Ellen Harris. She does this uh, very prestigious certificate course. Um, so we've all um, received a lot of training around copyright, very knowledgeable about copyright. So if you do have any questions, you can reach out to us. Um, I'm just going to point out we do have a help page uh, on our website. It's on the library website. Some of this information used to be on the main memorial website, but we moved it over to the library website. Uh, you can find it under using the libraries uh, and the last link there in the drop down is copyright help. Um, and so there's a lot of really great information on our pages, including our frequently asked questions um, and all of our contact information of who to contact if you have questions, like in the slide I just showed you. Um, so check that out if you um, have anything else that you want to uh, learn about, or if you forget anything that I've mentioned, we do have a lot of really good resources on our library page. Yeah, so why is copyright important? As I mentioned, we all are responsible for knowing the basics. Um, of copyright law when we're dealing with copyrighted material. Um, and right now it's a bit of a tumultuous time for educational institutions when it comes to copyright, uh, with numerous lawsuits filed by Access Copyright, uh, which represents and collects royalties for, for Canadian writers. Um, we just had a very uh, important decision just got delivered recently. Um, their case actually went all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, so I could talk about that forever, <laughs> but I won't bore you with all that legal stuff. Um, I just want to point out that under the Canadian Copyright Act, it is illegal to make a copy of a work without the copyright holder's permission, with some exceptions, and we're going to learn about those today. Um, and so if you are an employee and you're using materials in a way that violates copyright, you could potentially be opening up the um, university for a lawsuit. Um, copyright holders can sue, uh, lawsuits are expensive, and so that's why we really think it's so important to have sessions like this and have a lot of education around the, the copyright basics so uh, we all know what we can and can't do um, with copyrighted material. Uh, you might also think, some people say to me, well, how are they going to know what I'm doing with copyright material if I'm using Brightspace? Only my students can see that. Um, I can tell you that Access Copyright actually had people register for online courses at universities so they could check out what um, faculty were doing in their learning management systems. Um, so some of the publishers uh, who are very adversarial with the universities at the moment are pretty sneaky. Um, so that's why we want to, to make sure that there's this education component and you guys all know some of the basics. And so we'll all be abiding by copyright law and avoiding lawsuits. That's very important. Okay, so copyright basics. Um, copyright literally means the right to copy. So copyright is the exclusive legal right to reproduce, um, produce, reproduce, publish, or perform an original, literary, artistic, dramatic, or musical work. 
Um, so the creator is usually the copyright holder, um, but sometimes it can be the publishing company, uh, another type of corporation, a government uh, institution, a university. So it does depend. Um, it's usually the creator, but it can be other people as well. And what does it mean to copy? What is legally considered copying? You reproduce or make a copy if you photocopy a work, if you scan chapters from a textbook and email them to your students, if you save a PDF of a journal article and upload it to Brightspace. Um, so those are all considered copying. So technically under our uh, Canadian Copyright Act, you don't have the right to do that without the permission of the copyright holder. But the cool thing about the Canadian Copyright Act is that it's all about balance between um, copyright holders and users of the material. And they have these really fun things called exceptions, which are awesome. So that's what we're gonna learn about today. I like to emphasize what you can do with material without having to ask any permission. Um, so we can empower ourselves to know what we can actually do with this material. So some of the exceptions that allow you to make copies um, include the educational exemption uh, and fair dealing, and we'll learn about those today. Uh, institutional licenses, so those are things that the library would have when we um, subscribe to things like ebooks or e-journals. Um, and the work may be in the public domain, we'll learn about what that means. Um, it may have been created with the intention of having it used freely, like with certain Creative Commons licenses or open access journals uh, or open textbooks. So those six things there are some of the basic exceptions, um, where if you're uh, going by those exceptions, you don't have to worry about violating copyright because you won't be. So that's what I, I like instructors to know about. What can you do? What are the fun things that we're allowed to do? So we'll talk about first the education exemption. Um, so educational institutions are given specific exemptions for copying. Um, so one of them is displaying um, copyrighted material in a PowerPoint presentation. So if you have an image or a chart or a graph, you can display that in class. So all of these are going to have a little asterisk. Certain conditions must be met. <laughs> uh, so some of the conditions typically are it, it must be a legally obtained copy. Um, so we really don't want to be using um, illegally obtained material, things that are bootlegged or things that you shouldn't have had access to. So if it's legally obtained, you're okay. Um, you must cite the source. That's always uh, important with copyrighted material. And it should fall within the fair dealing guidelines, which I'll talk about next. It's also a good idea when you're using copyrighted material um, to check to see if there's a statement from the copyright owner expressly forbidding this type of use. Uh, so even though things may be uh, permitted under the Canadian Copyright Act, the final say really is with the copyright holder, and they may decide that their material cannot be used uh, by a university or displayed in a PowerPoint. So they, that's, it's rare, but it's good to check to make sure that you're not doing something with it that the copyright owner is expressly forbidding. Um, you can play a sound recording or show a film in class. Um, so that's totally okay. Um, and the nice thing about that is our legal counsel has determined that this applies to remote and online teaching environments as well. Um, so that's awesome. <laughs> uh, so you don't need to worry about playing films in class or in a remote class or in Brightspace. Um, so again, the exceptions would be legally obtained copy. Uh, so if you see something uh, that's been uploaded to YouTube, say it's a really recent feature film that Disney owns and you're like, oh, it's on YouTube, probably don't link to that. <laughs> that's probably not supposed to be there. Um, that's probably an illegal copy that's been uploaded to the internet. Um, and sometimes there's those awful file sharing sites where people are uploading copyrighted material that they really have no right to be. I always direct instructors away from that stuff. Um, if there's uh, a film that you need to show, contact the library. We are happy to purchase it, for, purchase it for you. So we can purchase a DVD or a streaming version if it's available. So that's much safer uh, from a copyright perspective. Uh, and also I always caution instructors that just because you find it online somewhere, like someone's posted it to YouTube, um, that can disappear. They disappear a lot if they're illegally posted. So if it isn't the copyright holder who's posted that um, and you're linking to it, I just recently experienced this um, helping um, CITL with uh, copyright in an online course. And the professor had linked to a video on YouTube and I was going in to check for copyright and it was already gone. There was already a big notice saying, this video has been removed, it's not available. So YouTube is getting notifications from copyright holders and deleting a lot of um, things that shouldn't be up there. So that's why it's better to contact the library, let us buy a legal copy for you um, or a streaming version if we can, that you know is gonna be there when your students try to access it. Uh, you are absolutely allowed to post things in the library's e-reserve system or in Brightspace, uh, again, with some exceptions. And you don't even need to really memorize all those, because if you're using uh, our e-reserve system, we're going to help you with all that. 
and you can reproduce an image, a chart, or a graph, or a sample question from a textbook for a quiz, test, or exam. So there's an exemption uh, in the Copyright Act for reproducing material for examination purposes, which is pretty awesome. So any, I'm going to just briefly pause to see if there's any questions about that. Move right along. Um, so I mentioned uh, streaming content. One of the things that um, the library did last year when we were all teaching remotely uh, was really beef up all of our um, streaming uh, video subscriptions. So we have a guide on our website to our streaming content. Um, so the, <clears throat> the first part of the guide here, you can see some of these are listed. Um, these are multidisciplinary, but we also, if you scroll down, we have them by subject. So we have education, English, music, where there's lots of streaming audio, nursing, health sciences, psych, poli sci, theater, and visual arts are some of the categories we pulled out where we have really robust subscription packages to streaming film. Um, so for example, this is one of our big packages that covers a lot of the major um, like feature film companies. Um, so you can see we have, we literally have thousands and thousands of films that we're already subscribing to at streaming, which you might not have known. Um, and you can see a lot of these are feature films. You can all cancel your Netflix subscription after you watch this recording, um, realizing that there's so much available through the library. And if there's something we don't have, just ask. We are able to add a lot of um, streaming subscriptions on a title by title basis. Um, so I, I was able to find a lot of streaming films for faculty over the last year. Oh, this is our Criterion collection, which I think has over 40,000 films. Um, these are some of the documentaries. So there's lots of amazing content that you can use um, that we purchase access to. Right. So the next thing we'll talk about is our fair dealing exception. So under the Canadian Copyright Act, um, it's okay to copy short excerpts for the purpose of research, private study, criticism, reviews, news reporting, and education, which is what we're all doing here. Um, so some of the uh, things that you have to do is include the source. Obviously, I mentioned that as well. Um, so you want to include like the name of uh, the author of the work. That's usually important. Um, and some licenses may not permit fair dealing. So if you're using material through the library, it's always a good idea to double check with us. We have certain publishers who um, they won't let us really do anything with their with their material. Uh, so we do have some very strict publishers that we deal with where some things that you are allowed to do technically under the Canadian Copyright Act, when we sign a license with them, they're forbidding us to do it. So it doesn't necessarily apply to everything. Um, but in general, um, you can copy short excerpts for educational purposes if you include the source. And what is a short excerpt? So what does that actually mean? Um, so this is not from the Canadian Copyright Act. A short excerpt is not defined in the legislation. Uh, so what um, universities have done, they've got together and um, formed some guidelines that we're all using. So these are guidelines recommended by Universities Canada, which was formerly the Association of Universities and Colleges of Canada. Um, so they had some legal um, teams consulting on this and they drafted some guidelines that they felt were reasonable for universities to use. Um, they were adopted by Memorial University. So th this is what we're considering uh, fair dealing. So up to 10% of a copyright protected work, um, one chapter from a book, a single article from a periodical, uh, an entire artistic work. Uh, I won't read them all out, so they're all there. So, uh, so for example, if you have a print book and you wanted to scan you know, half of the print book, and put it up in Brightspace because you didn't want your students to have to buy the book, that might not be considered fair dealing, right? So if you're trying to make, you know, have students not purchase something, so the publisher's not getting royalties from that book because you're scanning a significant portion of that book, like half the book, uh, that's where the courts are less likely to think of that as fair dealing. However, if it's a single chapter, um, if you're making a reading list and you have, you know, 10 different books and you have a single chapter from each book, um, and the library scanning that and putting that up in our e-reserve system, that's considered fair dealing. Uh, so it's really about the amount of, of copying that you're doing. Um, and so this is our definition of a short excerpt. This is all on our, our webpage under our, our frequently asked questions as well. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, oh, and in terms of uh, an entire artistic work, um, so again, if you decide to digitize, say, one or two diagrams for a book and use them in a PowerPoint, and you cite the source, that's likely to fall within fair dealing. Um, but if you decide to take a textbook and digitize all the images and graphs, again, so the students don't have to buy it, that's less likely to fall within the fair dealing guidelines. 
Um, so this is why open textbooks are so great. Uh, so instead of trying to copy from uh, textbooks that have copyright on them, we're really uh, recommending and um, suggesting that uh, faculty have a look into open textbooks. Uh, so they're textbooks that have been funded, published, and licensed to be freely used and distributed. So they won't cost your students any money. Um, and a lot of them um, also allow you to modify them. Um, so you can actually adapt and modify them for your own teaching needs and for your own specific course. Uh, all of the um, open textbooks on our guide are ones that have been reviewed by faculty working at universities that are being used by universities or affiliated with an with a educational institution. Uh, so we did some vetting of open textbooks and pulled out, for example, the, all the open textbooks that are available from Canadian universities. Um, I'm trying to find open textbooks by Memorial University authors. You see, I have one there already. Uh, so if you know if any of our faculty who have uh, created an open textbook, I would love to know about it so I could add it to this guide as well. Um, and so there's no copyright restrictions on open textbooks. So they're a really good choice. Um, and I've got a lot of the Grenfell faculty who have switched over to open textbooks. Okay, I'm gonna break it up with a little bit of a true or false question. Okay, if the library has a subscription to an e-journal, I can upload a PDF of an article from that journal to Brightspace. Is that true or is that false? Okay, so that is actually false. The answer to that question is it depends. Um, so we have access to a lot of online content um, and we're signing licensing agreements. Some things are permitted and some things aren't. Uh, so just because you access it through the library does not necessarily mean we have permission to put a copy in a learning management system like Brightspace. Um, and the license does uh, trump the exceptions in the Copyright Act, as I mentioned. Um, so it's uh, a really good way to avoid doing something with our licensed material that you shouldn't is check with the library or use our e-reserve system. And we, we go and check all that uh, when we put that together for you. And then, oh, what about the internet? Um, so this is a question that I get a lot. Um, if there's no copyright symbol, the material isn't copyrighted, right? So I can use it however I want. <laughs> True or false? Okay, so that is also false. So there's a lot of content you can find through Google that's free and that you don't actually have to pay to view it. Um, so some people think if it's just on a website and you can Google it, then it's okay to copy and paste it and use it however you want, but that is false. So in Canada, an original work is automatically covered by copyright. Um, the copyright symbol is not required. It's only recommended. Um, so don't fall into that trap where you think, oh, there's no little symbol, so it doesn't have any copyright. Copyright is automatic. Okay, another true or false question. Something is in the public domain if it is freely available to the public, like a site I find through Google. So I get asked about public domain a lot, and people are very confused usually about what that means. So is it if it's in the public domain, does that mean uh, if I find it through Google and it's freely available to the public, that's what that means? No, false again. Oh no, <laughs> that's not true at all. Uh, so when we talk about the public domain, it's a very specific legal designation. So just because you can Google it and get to it, that doesn't necessarily mean it's in the public domain. Um, so in Canada, it means that copyright for that work has expired. Um, and in Canada, copyright expires 50 years after the death of the copyright holder. Um, so for example, um, Isaac Newton's Principia, Principia, I'm not actually sure how to say that. <laughs> My Latin is not great. <laughs> um, so that was published in 1687. Um, Isaac Newton definitely been dead for more than 50 years. Uh, so that's something that has entered the public domain. So it no longer has copyright on it at all. So you don't have to um, ask permission uh, or pay to do just about anything you want with it. You can uh, adapt it, you can um, copy it. Um, and there's, there's nothing, you don't even have to cite it actually. You don't even have to cite the source when something's in the public domain. One thing to think about though, um, that's also get, that also gets confused with the public domain, um, is if a scholar recently publishes an annotated version of that, or maybe does a new translation of that work, um, that new work that they're producing can have copyright on it, right? So the original one from 1687 is in the public domain, but a new translation that's annotated with new research, um, that then has copyright for that researcher. So then you don't wanna just be photocopying that and using that in your course. Um, creators can also choose to immediately release their work directly into the public domain. Um, and so that is awesome. A lot of people are doing that. 
Um, there are literally millions of images available online that are in the public domain or under Creative Commons license. And we'll talk about um, Creative Commons next. Um, so again, we put together a handy dandy library guide for you on how to find open access images. So instead of just doing a basic Google image search and finding things that have copyright on them that you may or may not be able to be using um, in PowerPoint or in Brightspace, um, the better option is to use literally the millions of images out there that have no copyright on them. Um, so there's public domain images, um, collections of public domain images listed on this site, as well as Creative Commons images, Creative Commons images. And you don't have to ask permission, you can freely use these, uh, these images. Uh, so we're really recommending that, particularly for online courses. Um, and so again, we try to um, collect collections by subject area to make it easier for you guys. Uh, and there's lots of information on the guide, as you can see, about using images in general. Another really handy thing to do if you're looking for images to use is use Google's advanced image search. So I don't know if you guys have ever done this, but if you use the advanced image search, there's all kinds of cool filters you can use. But the one that I really like is under usage rights, you can find images that you are free to use. So I actually do this when I'm uh, doing a Google image search, I'll click advanced and under usage rights, I'll click Creative Commons licenses. So then all those images that you're getting, you know that it's okay to use them in your PowerPoint or on your website um, or whatever you wanna do with them. So uh, I really recommend that when you're looking for images for your courses um, versus using things that could be copyrighted. Um, other things to look for, does the content have a Creative Commons license? <clears throat> so that's uh, really important. So let's see here. These are the six different Creative Commons licenses. Um, so I won't get into the exact details of all of these, um, but all of the, oops, sorry, I'm just gonna go back to that one. Um, all of the six licenses um, can be used for non-commercial purposes. So it's, so I don't get into all the details of all the six different licenses because if you're just using it for educational purposes in your classroom, um, and you're crediting the um, original creator, you're covered by all six of the licenses. So when you see that CC, um, it's, it's fine to use for classroom use. And some of them have um, different specifications for when you're using it for profit and things like that. Um, but if you're not, if you're not uh, modifying the image in any way and you're just putting it in your syllabus or your PowerPoint, you're totally fine under all the licenses. Um, another thing to think about is, is it open access? So this is the uh, symbol for open access. And there's been a huge movement um, within academia over the last decade uh, to try to move away from um, journals that you have to pay really huge subscription fees to. Um, and we're moving over to open access journals that are free for everyone to be able to access. Um, at Memorial University, we actually have an open access authors fund that you can apply to, to cover any fees that an open access journal is charging you. Um, because uh, in order to make open access journals, they sometimes have to charge authors fees, not the same as vanity presses. It's a very different concept. Um, and so rather than the library paying um, very large subscription fees, we're happy to help with the author's fees. Um, and so you can go to our website to find out how you can apply for getting your open access author's fees covered. We want to encourage people to publish in open access journals. And if you're using an open access journal or an open access ebook, then it doesn't have copyright on it and you can be really safe using it in your classes. Um, and other things I mentioned already, is there a statement anywhere um, on the website or on the material that you're using that expressly forbids you to do what you're trying to do with the content, right? So you do have to uh, pay attention to that and listen to the copyright holder if they're telling you not to do a thing <laughs> with their copyrighted work. Um, so right now, you're probably thinking that that's a lot to keep track of and figure out. Um, so that's why there's a, a lot easier way for you to uh, manage uh, copyright clearance for your course materials, um, and that is to get the library to help you out. So we have a really comprehensive uh, e-reserve service where you can just give us your syllabus or your reading list and we go through it and we just do all the copyright clearance for you. So if it's an e if it's a book and we can purchase it as an e-book, um, we do that. Um, if it's a film and we can purchase it streaming, we can do that. Um, if it needs to be scanned, if it's a chapter from a print book, we can do the scanning. Um, I really hate for instructors to be spending their time scanning things. I think that's really not the best use of your time when we have staff who can do that for you. Um, so we're happy to digitize material, 
um, and put it up in a reading list for you. And we, if we have to pay copyright clearance fees, which we um, very much often do, we do have a copyright clearance fund uh, within the library. And we manage all of the um, copyright clearance fees if we have to pay them through our e-reserve system. Um, and so it's basically pay per click. So we only get charged if your student clicks on the article or book chapter and, and accesses it. Um, so we pay copyright clearance usually when how much uh, of the material you need digitized exceeds fair dealing. So if it's more than 10% of a book, what do we do? Um, so we are able to get copyright clearance and pay for copyright clearance for um, scanned uh, portions of a book that exceed 10%. We've done that a lot over the past year. I've even gotten um, permission to scan an entire book. Um, sometimes we go directly to the copyright holder. Um, and then particularly over the last year, they were being very, very lenient with us. Um, and sometimes publishers would even give me a PDF file that I could upload and not even charge us a fee. Um, so we're, we are very experienced with working with publishers and working with um, the Copyright Clearance Center, um, who represents a lot of the authors. Um, so we are paying whenever we have to use more than 10% of a work, and then you don't have to worry about it. Uh, let's see here. So you can basically add any type of material to an e-reserves list. So this includes things like Word documents, so you could upload your syllabus, um, class handouts, we can link to videos, you can upload a PowerPoint presentation, we can link to websites. It's very robust. There's all kinds of things you can put on your reading list. Um, and it is linked to your Brightspace shell. So if you are using Brightspace, um, your students can access e-reserves either through the library website, um, or it can be accessed directly through your Brightspace shell. Um, so it, it doesn't matter which way the students access it from the library website directly or through your Brightspace shell, it's going to look the same to them. So it's very consistent. Um, so you can have this little widget that displays all of the course materials that we've done copyright clearance for. Or you can actually directly link to things because I know it's important sometimes to embed uh, in the actual um, you know, point of where the student is actually accessing week one, you might want to embed a links to your reading list. Um, so our e-reserve system does allow you um, to get a permalink where you can add a link to Brightspace or you could email it to your students. Um, you can even um, get a, a link to a particular week. So maybe you just want to link to week one readings that you can embed or email to your students. Um, and you can also, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> you can also link directly to a particular item in your reading list. <clears throat> so it's really, uh, the e-reserve system works really well with Brightspace. Um, they kind of designed it with Brightspace in mind. So the two talk to each other. So I always encourage uh, faculty, um, if you are using Brightspace, instead of going in there and just uploading all kinds of stuff uh, into Brightspace um, without being able to check, do the back end check of copyright clearance. <clears throat> if you use our e-reserve system, we can do all the copyright clearance and checking for you. Um, and we also use, oh my goodness, <clears throat> it's very humid here today, so my allergies are acting up, which makes me hoarse. Um, we also use our e-reserve system to track copyright. So if we are ever challenged um, and access copyright decides to poke around at mine and say like, hmm, what kind of, what are you using in your courses? Uh, we can actually generate a report instantly by semester um, and show them how many things we uh, had access to through um, our licensing, what we um, used fair dealing for, what we had to get additional copyright clearance for, whether it was open access, et cetera. Um, so we're actually keeping track of all of that within our e-reserve system. Um, and it's less work for you guys too. So why use library e-reserves? It's less work for you. Um, so just give us your list of stuff you need for your course. And we're happy to do all the checking, uh, to purchase material, to digitize, you shouldn't have to be worrying about any of that. Um, and then you don't really have to be as concerned about copyright because we are happy to take care of that for you. Um, and we can also adjust ebook licenses for you. And that's something else to think about. Um, if you just link to an ebook uh, yourself in Brightspace or just tell your students, oh, that's an ebook through the library, go have a look at it. Um, a lot of our licenses, the default license is only one student at a time can have access to that ebook. Uh, so if you're asking them to have their this chapter read by Wednesday, you know what's happening on Monday and Tuesday, probably Tuesday night, all the students in your class are trying to click on that ebook link and only one of them can access it. Um, so if you let us know what ebooks you'd like us to use, what we can do is beef up that subscription. 
uh, and have it be a multi-user license. So it's important for us to know what ebooks are being used in courses because we will pay extra for the better license for those, those materials. So like I said, there's a lot to think about uh, with the copyright clearance um, and it's a lot easier for the library to do it for you than for you guys to have to worry about all this. Um, so that's it on the library side of it. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention before we go is for you guys to think about protecting your own copyright. So it's not just about the copyrighted material you're using in your classes, but as instructors um, and researchers, you're creating work that has copyright on it as well. So your course notes and your lectures and your research um, is all protected by copyright. Um, so I think it's really good to be empowered um, as instructors to know what your rights are under the Canadian Copyright Act. Oh, another true or false question. Uh, so in Canada, a creator author is always the copyright owner, even if the work was created during the course of their employment. Is that true or false? That's actually false. Uh, so when you create work in the course of your employment, um, the copyright owner is your employer. So that's very important to know. Um, so unless it's otherwise stated by a collective agreement or other type of contract. Uh, so it isn't the default under the Copyright Act. Um, however, at Memorial University, uh, MUNFA members in our collective agreement, it does stipulate that uh, MUNFA members own their own intellectual property. Uh, so if you are a MUNFA member, everything that you're creating is your own intellectual property. Um, it could be different if you are in a, a per course instructor, if you're Lumen. Um, so we'd, we'd have to look into that. Um, so unless it's otherwise, otherwise stated by a collective agreement or other type of contract, your employer could be the copyright holder of your work. So for example, um, a staff member at Memorial um, who's taking photographs for Marcom, Marcom and the university would own the copyright in those photos, not the staff member. Um, but MUNFA is very lucky that we have a strong collective agreement where we can keep our own intellectual property. But <clears throat> it's <clears throat> there's my voice again. But it's important to know that when you leave the university site, so if you're using Brightspace or if you're using the library's e-reserve service, so that's owned by the university, the university has to abide by the MUNFA contract. Um, so just because you upload something to Brightspace or to the library e-reserve system, you're not giving up your copyright. Um, so if you're using third party softwares, which I know a lot of faculty were doing, particularly over the last year um, with remote teaching, you really wanna make sure you check out the terms of service. I'm just gonna have a bit more water here. <clears throat> so if, <laughs> if you're going to post on, <clears throat> maybe we can edit this out when we, <laughs> when we post the recording, oh my God. Um, when you're going to post to a third party provider, so I just use YouTube as an example, uh, because it is a popular place where professors do tend to put material, um, just go in, into the terms of service and have a little look around. Um, what are you agreeing to when you upload your intellectual property? Um, so if we look at, here we go, terms of service, here we go. Um, this is what I wanted to show you. Yes, here we go. Um, the content you submit must not include third party intellectual property, such as copyrighted material, unless you have permission from that party or are otherwise legally entitled to do so. Um, so this is important to remember if you're uploading to uh, not to Brightspace or the library uh, e-reserve site and you're uploading content to YouTube, for example, the educational um, exemption no longer applies because you're not making that just available to your students. That's now out there on the internet for everybody to see. So you have to be extra careful about are you using copyrighted material in that? Um, so if, if you're doing a recording of your lecture with PowerPoints, do you have graphs and charts and things like that in there? And then you're putting it on YouTube, um, you are not going to be covered by the educational exemption. So you are in Brightspace and you are in the library's e-reserves because it is a secure password protected um, site where the students have to enter their MUN ID to access it. Um, and so sites might have, um, up, you know, uploading terms like this where they're cautioning you about uploading copyrighted material. Um, and so it's something like YouTube's visibility settings. Uh, I don't know if you know about this, but I like pointing this out to faculty. You do have some different settings you can use on YouTube. I post a lot of stuff to YouTube as well. Um, I have a lot over the last year and I took advantage of this. Um, so there's uh, different settings. There we go. Um, so public is the default setting. 
um, which means it's visible to anyone and it's Google searchable. So anything that you're posting, if there's copyrighted material in your lecture and you're posting that as a public YouTube video, that is very less likely to be considered fair dealing. And again, you're not covered by the education exemption. Um, so the one that I use a lot is unlisted. So before I publish a video, I'll make it unlisted and it's only visible to people who know the direct URL. So it's not Google searchable. Um, so if I put that link, say, in a Brightspace shell, or I email it to my students, um, or I embed it in Brightspace, uh, only the students who are going into Brightspace and, and have that direct URL, they're the only ones who can see it. Um, so that's a better option than having it be public. That's somewhat likely to be considered fair dealing. Now, it's not necessarily going to be considered fair dealing, because what can a student do with that link? They could share it, right? They could put it on the internet, and then everybody would have access to it. Um, the most secure would be uh, private, which is only visible to people who have been invited. So this is very much more likely to be considered fair dealing, but it's kind of a pain uh, for instructors because you would have to enter each student's individual email in order to uh, invite them to see it. Um, and your students would also need a YouTube account, which you know people have various feelings about making students create accounts in third party software. Um, so that's something to think about with YouTube. Um, and looking at the terms of service, just like you would with any other third party, is like, what rights are you granting YouTube if you're using your own intellectual property? Um, read the fine print. Um, so you're actually granting YouTube a license to use that content, including with their affiliate businesses, I don't know who those are, and granting users the right to reproduce, distribute, prepare derivative works, display, and perform it. So it's up to you if you are comfortable with that or not. Um, I have uh, made YouTube videos for the library that are publicly available. Um, they're linked on our on our website. And I'm okay with that, but it's really up to you. That's why you want to make sure you know what you're agreeing to when you're uploading content to a, a service like that. But look, this is the, one of the things that made me nervous about the terms of service when I looked at it. Um, YouTube keeps a copy of your video even if you delete it. That kind of made me go, hmm, didn't know that <laughs> until I actually looked into the terms of service. It was too late. I already had videos up there. Um, but really important to, to make sure you're comfortable with what you're doing with your own copyrighted uh, material because you own the copyright. Um, and that is it for me. I still have a voice, thank goodness. <laughs> so I'm just going to close the slideshow. There we go. Stop sharing. There we are. So um, I'll just open it up now for any questions if anybody has any. Hi there, it's uh, Bill Kavanaugh. Can I jump in with uh, a couple of questions? Absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks so much for your presentation. I, I'm actually with CITL. I'm, I'm just kind of here as an observer, but uh, this has been a super helpful presentation. And, and oh, first of all, th thank you so much for it. Um, I noticed you mentioned, um, and I think I missed part of the context because I'm one of those pesky participating multitaskers. But you Me mentioned uh, you mentioned um, uh, a, a uh, interpretation by Mon Legal Counsel, uh, I believe, re re regarding the Copyright Act, which um, I th I think I'm, I, it's important that you share, and that's great. My question on that is whether or not um, that interpretation may have been uh, published in some way uh, on on the Mon website for you know faculty and staff. Uh, to have access to what that ruling was or, or some general guideline. Um, right. right, that's a good question. Um, I think it is answered under our FAQ, I believe. Um, I don't know if that, like that council decision has been published, but I know um, I sit on the, um, the copyright committee that's university wide and our um, council sits on that committee as well. And so they advised us and advised CITL um, that in general, in Canada, universities are considering um, playing a video in a Brightspace shell, the equivalent of a classroom. So although the, the Canadian Copyright Act doesn't specify that, um, you know, with legislation, there's always interpretation from the lawyers afterward. And our council feels very confident 
that if you're teaching a remote course or a fully online course and you play a film in Brightspace, or you can even play a film, you know, in a WebEx meeting, um, they consider that a virtual classroom. Um, and so they don't have any issue with that. Um, so you would you would have the universities the university would have your back if you played a film in a virtual or online classroom, because um, they consider it the equivalent of a, an in-person classroom. And the legislation really specifies an in-person classroom. And I think they just kind of forgot about online learning and the fact that we're going to put it as an online classroom. Um, so we really prefer um, make sure it's a legally obtained copy, right? So if it's something that you feel comfortable that it's a legally obtained version, that's fine. Um, you can get the library to purchase a streaming version. We have a lot of streaming films. And oftentimes when people ask me to buy a streaming film, we already have it. And I'm like, here's the link. Um, our third option is to digitize a DVD or a VHS. Uh, we are actually allowed to do that. Uh, with some exceptions. So it has to be, again, legally obtained copy. Um, it can't have any digital locks. We're not allowed to break digital locks, which some of the DVDs have. Um, and it has to be destroyed after 30 days of the, the course ending. Um, so we did uh, digitize uh, some DVDs and VHSs last year uh, for people who were teaching remotely. We can't always. Um, I have worked with some instructors on online courses, and we haven't been able to buy it streaming, and we haven't been able to um, digitize. And if it's a fully online, you know, um, asynchronous course, we're kind of stuck. There's not really anything we can do um, that does happen. Um, it's really difficult to get copyright clearance for a lot of the um, films being made by like major companies. Um, I tried for months to get permission uh, to digitize a, a DVD that one faculty member had, and it was a PBS documentary. Could not get anyone to you know answer any of my inquiries at PBS finally ended up phoning the number on like the PBS shop and got got a hold of a supervisor and finally got an answer of you are not allowed to digitize our DVDs don't you dare uh, and I was like okay thanks um, so it, it's really difficult if there's a digital lock um, and there's no streaming version that we can license in Canada um, it is hard to get permission to, to from companies to digitize um, but we will try but the better option is to try to buy a streaming version for sure did that answer your question, Bill? It did indeed. And I've got a, a, another couple of quick ones, but I know there are other mm -hmm. participants. So I guess you're the chair. Um, <laughs> but if, if, if nobody else is ready to ask it, I do have a couple other quick ones. Sure. That's okay. Um, so you also mentioned, and by way of my question, I, I'm, I'm actually re-highlighting, I think what you made was a very important point about how collective agreements are, are, are a big part of, of copyright. I mean, the act, of course, is the overarching um, document. But I, I know internally, uh, you know, like CITL is aware, for example, that Marine Institute collective agreement for their instructors is different than uh, those at, uh, at, at, you know, the main, main campus, uh, and, and you, we also pointed out even on like main campus, uh, say MUNFA versus a uh, per course instructor may be different. So I'm yes. wondering if you could comment on, on for anybody watching this, who might be in, in any of those camps about whether they should sim simply go to their collective agreement or, or, or is there some sort of direction on our MUN pages? about how each of those collective agreements uh, interact with the Copyright Act. And I'm, I'm going to um, apologize for that, for being very familiar with um, MUNFA, because I'm a MUNFA member, <laughs> and not super familiar with all the other collective agreements, unfortunately. Um, so I think that's something I definitely will incorporate into my next presentation, is going to look at some of those collective agreements. Um, so yeah, it's mostly just being aware. If you're not in MUNFA and you're creating um, copyrighted material that you're using as part of your employment, um, make sure you look at whatever collective agreement you're covered by. Um, and if you're not covered by any kind of collective agreement, the default's going to be your employer, unless there's something in writing, there's some kind of contract in place prior to you creating the material. Um, so it's important to know that, I think. Um, I, I do a class with um, the visual arts students here at Grenfell about copyright and artwork. Um, and when I tell them that, you know, um, some of the, the creators who uh, worked at creating comics and graphic novels, like Stan Lee didn't own his creations, his own creations. He didn't own Spider-Man. Um, they're just like, what? <laughs> um, so just being aware that, you know, when you're being, uh, when you're an employee and you're creating things, that you don't necessarily own the copyright. Um, and that, that has tremendous implications for visual artists, as you can imagine. Great, thanks. Uh, and, and, and sorry. If, if... Point, can I interrupt Bill just for a sec? Absolutely, it's, it's yeah. Your, it's your it's your point. Uh, 
because they they somebody told me when I was at a conference once that if I was doing something for the school system, uh, I should create it uh, using my own Gmail account, and then share it like with NLESD. Right. So in other words, I'm doing it on my stuff. Now this was an American conference I was at. Right. What do you think? No, there's actually been some uh, some lawsuits around that. Um, where somebody was employed, there's a famous uh, lawsuit with a, a toy making company, and the person was trying to claim like, well, I had that idea for a toy like on my on my own time, you know, it does yeah. it didn't work. <laughs> sure. uh, so it, yeah, it you have to keep things really separate, um, and it depends on um, you know, it's going to depend on your job, you know, if you're a, if you're a salaried person where you're not getting paid by the hour, uh, what counts as work time and what doesn't, you know. Um, and if you're using it in your course in an educational institution, I, it's going to be hard to argue that that's not part of your employment if it's related to what you're employed to do. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that um, makes, but, no, no. yeah makes sense. Yeah. So just, just sending it from a Gmail account might not be a very, <laughs> might not be covered legally. <laughs> More probably better for a presentation to as a consultant when you're just paying as a fee for service. Yes, you know, that's yes. what and if you're a time. consultant, you can yeah. you can make your own contract and you can put in there that you retain right. copyright. Right. Yeah. Which you yeah. definitely want to do. Uh, Glenn, I, I do have one more quick one as I stated, but I see that you put a question in the chat as well. Um, oh. About uh, an embedding videos. Do you want to yes. just mention that verbally or uh, audibly here? Yeah, the uh, the point, uh, Crystal, is sometimes I'll use a third party app like Edpuzzle or something and then embed it in like a Pear Deck or that sort of thing. And then if I post that on Brightspace, because I'm thinking more uh, asynchronous, like a self paced thing. So then mm -hmm. they go in and what's the situation there? It would be private, yeah. I guess, on Brightspace. Yeah, so you'd want to just make sure that you check with the, the terms of use. Um, so if you, so for example, if you have a Netflix subscription, um, that's a personal subscription. It does stipulate in Netflix that you, you can't take that video and then, you know, um, distribute that or play it in a public venue. Um, so you definitely want to read, just have a check for any fine print with any, any third party service. Um, like I said, it would be covered under the educational exemption, but providers of, of online streaming content can make you sign agreements uh, when you access that material or have a subscription to it or whatever the case may be, where they can tell you what you can and can't do with it, unfortunately. Um, and that does trump the copyright law. Uh, so that's what we encounter every now and then with certain um, ebooks or e journals that we have subscriptions to. They specifically forbid us from putting a PDF up in Brightspace or forbid us from, from putting a PDF up in our e reserve system. I hate that. I would love to cancel subscriptions with those types of providers because I'm like, how, we're paying you so much money and we're not allowed to put a PDF up. Um, the Harvard Business Review is notorious. We're not even allowed to link to an article directly. Um, they're very, very yeah, crazy about copyright. Um, so the answer to that, that question, I think, is it depends. It depends yeah. on where that third party uh, content is coming from and if they have anything stating that you can't do that with it. If that answers your question. So I promise this is my last one, but it, oh, no. it, by way of my question, it's also meant to be a little bit informational as well. Um, and it is related to the question about the, the video stuff, and and you did go into detail about YouTube, which I think is super helpful for those uh, instructors listening. Um, oh, pardon me, just need to mute that for one second there. Um, so my so my question, uh, my question is about, um, or sorry, my yeah, we we actually have a video uploader here. I apologize for the background noise there. We have a video uploader here that we created at CITL, and my understanding is that was done for copyright concerns. Yes. So, for example, if an instructor wants to uh, record a class or some sort of video and provide that to their students, they can actually upload it to our video uploader and provide a link as if very similar to YouTube, but it does require a MON login authentication. So, for example, if you use our video uploader, if you are not a uh, a MUN student who can't log in, then you cannot view the video. So it's meant to be a little bit informational, but also if you could kind of reiterate the copyright aspect of that, as opposed yeah, to, for example, and, using a YouTube service. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, um, I actually talked to a lot of different um, uh, copyright librarians at different universities um, about a year or two ago when we were investigating the whole digitizing of, of DVDs and VHSs. And um, the CITL is considered the gold standard. You guys have the gold standard video uploader um, because it's a secure server, it's password protected, and it also only delivers um, bits of that video in chunks to the person viewing it. So it serves two purposes. It helps people who have a very slow internet connection to be able to not have like, you know, buffering the little the circle donut, as I call it. Um, but also it makes it really secure from a, a copyright perspective. And so some of the other librarians were like jealous of our uh, CITL's video uploader. Um, so that's why our, our council is really okay with us digitizing a DVD or VHS, as long as it's using the Brightspace uh, system, which is password protected and really secure. Um, like I said, the only time we run into problems is with sometimes with some of the DVDs that have digital locks, uh, which we're not allowed to break to make a copy. Um, so things like, you know, a feature film, like, uh, you know, the new Marvel movies or something like that, they they have digital locks. We can't break them. We can't digitize them. They're not going to give me a subscription to a streaming version. Um, so sometimes we're stuck, um, but we were, uh, we were able to digitize quite a lot of material over the last year. Particularly VHSs. VHSs don't have digital locks. Loophole, and we kept all our VHSs at the library, so we can digitize those. Well, that's it for me in my line of questioning, okay. Crystal. Thank you so okay. much. This has been super helpful. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other questions? I just had the one for Bill that I put in the chat, but sort of related because that's because I'm just learning some of this, the MUN stuff. Can you read it, Bill? It, if I did a quick and dirty video of a session, can I just of, mm -hmm. you know, of a class? Because you because some of the classes are redundant, right? Like it's repeated three times the same class. Uh, do it once, upload it to your system, and then you stack it like almost like a YouTube channel. Or... And sorry, I don't mean to intrude on, on your session, Crystal, no, but uh, <laughs> but uh, no, with the video uploader, if you mean by systematically, if you mean if it can be done in an automated way, not to my current knowledge, but you know, feel free to reach out to me, you know, outside okay. of this session, right, and okay. we can explore it. Yeah. But but basically, anything. Too many people online. Maybe there. Maybe I'm just missing. There's a hundred people here. But... No, no, it's it's just us. But I think this this may be uh, being okay. recorded as well for people's benefit later. Um, oh, but 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 I absolutely. Apologies. I no. didn't know that because I missed. Sorry. I, I I think it's relevant to the session though. But 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 the short answer is, uh, yeah. If you create a video, uh, in any format, as long as you can, you have the file, right? Like an MP3 or whatever. As long as you can produce the file, then CITL can support you in uploading that into a YouTube style or YouTube esque format. And apparently, it's uh, uh it's great to learn. It's kind of a gold standard. Um, you can you you can upload it there, and only people who can authenticate the Mon login, i.e., your students, uh, will be able to see that. So no way for them to. Uh, I mean, I, there's always ra ways around everything, but nobody can go in and look at that unless they can uh, unless they can log in. So CITL definitely supports that. So you can certainly reach out to us um, if you if you need a hand with that for sure. Thanks. Uh, Glenn, we are recording the session, but I am going to reach out to, to everybody who's here and ask how comfortable you are in having this part of the presentation or the session in, uh, included in the recording. So I can, I can chop it off. Don't worry. <laughs> Thanks. I sometimes find the Q and A like the most helpful part. <laughs> so hopefully everybody doesn't mind that it, it's being recorded, but it's okay if you, if you don't feel comfortable. Any other questions for Crystal? We have a few minutes left. Nope. Great questions. I just hope everybody, um, you know, just to take away from this, that the library really is really knowledgeable around copyright. And we have librarians like me uh, in all of our branches who can um, help you and answer questions. Um, and we have really awesome, really well-trained uh, staff who are happy to um, put things up in e-reserve for you and purchase things for you. And we're here to make your life easier. Um, so reach out to us if you need something. Thank you very much, Crystal. This was very informative and uh, the Thank recording you. is going to go up on our website and it's going to be very help helpful for anybody who was not able to attend. So thank you again. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you for coming, everybody. Okay, bye.